the Connected Families podcast is made possible by listeners like us. My name is Katie Wetzel, and I'm a Connected Families certified parent coach and a pediatric nurse living in Nashville, Tennessee. My husband and I have four kids, ages 7 to 16, and two dogs, and we love to connect with each other in outdoor play. I hope you enjoy today's program. Hey, Lynn, before we get started, I want to ask you a few questions about the Sensitive and Intense Kids online course that you've taken a couple years to write. I helped you produce. It was, I know. (laughs) I started collecting ideas for this probably five years ago. (laughs) I'm awesome. And I know that it's a culmination of actually your whole career working with kids as an occupational therapist and starting connected families and coaching hundreds and hundreds of families. Well, we're really excited because the course is here. People are registering. Actually, hundreds of people have registered for it already. But I want to ask you a question. We knew the need was going to be really large. Would you just talk about the gap that you saw in what was available to parents and then how you filled that gap as you wrote the course? Well, I really felt like there's there's a number of gaps. One was just in faith-based resources. There wasn't a lot that really dealt with those kind of neuroatypical kids, neurodivergent, or just sensitive, intense, struggling kids. And most of what's available is just for, you know, kind of typical families with typical challenges that resolve fairly easily. So knowing that God's grace is such a huge, is essential part of helping these kids. I wanted something that integrates both the brain science and a solid scriptural faith-based approach as well. So that was one big gap. And another gap that I saw is a lot of what's out there is sort of these summits where you'll have like 20 different experts for an hour sharing all their ideas. And it can be great information, but it's more jumbled. It's, It's not thought through from beginning to end you know, and where do you even start in that? So I wanted something that was cohesive, that could make sense out of a struggling child's brain function for parents. So they have that insight, but then also give them some very basic tools to help their child that all fit together. Have a flow, a logic to it all. So that was a piece. And then the third gap was that we weren't really listening to parents. And so I wanted to bring in the voices and the stories and the examples of parents. And so this course has like 130 clips shared by (laughs) parents, their pains, their struggles, their joys, their learning, all that so that people feel understood like they're not alone. So those were some gaps that I saw, you know, kind of the scripture and science together, a cohesive flow and then just the voices of parents. Yeah, that's really good. I know that capturing the voices of parents was just so important to you and you held parent groups and did so many interviews with all of those families. They're your friends, our friends. But tell us maybe one or two other things that you feel parents are going to find really special about this course. Well, there's there's a road to hope diagram that explains kind of the stress cycle that families can get stuck in where it just feels like you're kind of spiraling downward. And then then how neuroplasticity is involved in that, but then how neuroplasticity, which is the the changeability Mm -hmm. (laughs) of the brain in response to environment, how that is really your road to hope. But then we really wanted to care for the souls and the, and the hearts of parents and kids in this. So there are soul care videos to help parents just be encouraged in this difficult journey. And there's a whole segment on healing shame aimed at in kids, but it you know it'll also teach parents just about healing the shame that can come with all the challenging behavior that usually is part of a sensitive, intense child daily life. It is harder to parent a sensitive and intense child. And so this course is built to come around you parents and to support you and to bring you big picture, but also tools 
to mm -hmm. help you walk through this. And really, I know it's on your heart, Lynn, as you wrote it. Most importantly, that there is so much hope for your family, for your child, and for the future. And so the registration is open right now. We hope you go to our show notes and find all of the information to register today because March 6th is when the community and support version of the course starts. So that's it, everybody. Go register. Thanks, Lynn. Mm -hmm. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. I'm Stacey Bellward. This is the Connected Families Podcast. Our purpose for the podcast is to guide you to receive God's grace and truth and then to equip you to pass that grace and truth onto your children. I'm so grateful that you are a part of the Connected Families community. Well, today I have with me Lynn Jackson, co-founder of Connected Families. Hi, Lynn. Hello, Stacy. Good to be here. I know, again. Well, today we get to do part two of a conversation that we started in episode 122, where we talked with Mandy Kuda, MD. We were addressing the question that many parents ask, which was, does my child need a diagnosis? We answered that one in part one. And so today we're back with Mandy and we're going to talk about what happens after you get the diagnosis, maybe autism, ADHD, ODD, anxiety anxiety disorders, or in my family's case, it was dyslexia. Like what then? So let's bring Mandy in. Hi, Mandy. Hi, Stacey. Hi, Lynn. Great to see you again and hear you. Yeah. Thanks for setting aside time in your busy schedule again to come and talk with us. You know, in the last episode, you introduced yourself very well for this podcast. Just a simple background is that uh, you received your medical training in the military. You're in the reserves now. And that's a big part, but you're also a mom of four. So maybe that was even more training. I don't know, Mandy. I definitely feel like having kids made me a better physician. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, in addition to that, you are in our parent certified coaching program. So just like really quickly, you're an MD. Why parent coaching certification for you? Well, it's a great question. And I would say it's even evolving in my future hope in how I might integrate it into a practice setting, but I really have grown to appreciate how much even in primary care, we do a lot of coaching and just having a focus area for me, like the parent coaching through Connected Families felt like the right fit. There's a lot of coaching certifications out there. And this was just the one that seemed to make the most sense in the approach that mm -hmm. I have in my practice. She gets to be MD comma CFCPC when she's done. That's so many <laughs> letters. Certified parent coach. <laughs> <laughs> so many letters. <laughs> there are so many letters. Yes. Well, let's get started with our conversation today talking about after the diagnosis comes, after you hear from your professional that there is autism, ADHD, ODD, anxiety, dyslexia, and I think that there's a lot of emotion mm -hmm. that is rolling around in parents when they get that final diagnosis. And it can be a range, right? It could be relief, like, whew, okay, now I know what's going on. It could be guilt, shame. I should have dealt with this earlier, regret, right? How did I parent in the past? Like just feeling bad about that if there really was struggle going on or or fear of the future. Sometimes even grief. It's like, oh, yeah. I this is just so much. And now there's words to articulate how heavy this yeah. feels for me. So let's just start with talking about how grace and truth looks in this really hard moment after a diagnosis. Can we chat about that? Who would like to start? God says that our trials bring us to maturity and even Christ was perfected through suffering. So, you know, to grieve well, if that's what your emotion is, but then to lean into what God has for you and his purposes in that. And I think that grief is kind of in that grief and releasing all the whatever difficult emotions pop up to sit in those with the Lord, bringing those to the Lord and without shame. <laughs> this is how I feel. And then receiving his comfort so that then you can 
move on to, you know, some gratitude. Okay, what am I grateful for in the midst of this difficult news? And how do I look for the opportunity and God's purposes in it? So that's kind of what I would say off the top of my head about that. I've experienced with, you know, families or, you know, even just an individual that I was offering a diagnosis that there's sometimes just this idea of having the truth. And you mentioned this idea of relief that, oh, this just explains a lot. And it sort of gives me a starting place. And I think that that, you know, what you described, Lynn, and sort of this grace idea, but then also having kind of the truth of this is how I'm built and gaining an understanding of my child, and this is how they're built. And then celebrating that in some ways when we can kind of get to that point, because we are fearfully and wonderfully made, as Psalm 139 says. It was an interesting one with the diagnosis of dyslexia. We learned it's hereditary. So instead of having conversations with my daughter, they were wanting to talk with my husband and I. And so we started having these conversations. Conversations I never knew. Like, this is a thing. So sometimes it was humorous, sometimes it wasn't, but we were like, wow, maybe that's why I still can't ever figure out left or right. There's no question that our ADHD apples were falling close to our tree in our family. (laughs) So that just leads us to the next question of now you go home, probably, I'm assuming, and you need to tell your child about the diagnosis. And so I just, there's a lot of questions around that. What's a good age to tell them? How do we tell them? How do we describe how it's manifesting in daily life? Like just all, all of that. Could you start with that, Amanda? Yeah. I think that the, you know, we talked about this on the last podcast, but the idea of a diagnosis is sort of a label that we use in the medical field to help us with driving, you know, treatment decisions, or maybe even, you know, sort of care pathway decisions, whether or not that's the words that you use with your child, as we're trying to sort of have that conversation is not, it's not required. So there may be a way of describing the diagnosis that represents something in your family that is very true to your child, helpful. And at, you know, at some point, depending on their age, you might want to actually say like, this is what the medical community would describe as this diagnosis. Can to you a- get practical on that? Are you sure. saying like, you know how dad can't sit still very long? Like, is that what you're saying? So I'll say in my family, we have a lot of energy. And so the way that the sort of highly sensitive personality type or that type of diagnosis is described in our family is, is that we are in a high energy situation right now. And this energy is coming out in a way that is not helpful. (laughs) And, you know, it's also inviting my kids to describe that and, you know, how that looks for me as well as for them. And so I think that as we talk through diagnoses, it's sort of, like you're saying, Stacey, and thank you for helping me get practical. That's what we want our kids to think of too. It's not just this sort of like name, but how does this look in my life? Yeah, we tend to have this belief that we should all be able to do everything just perfectly, you know, and kids certainly have that. If they feel like they've got any weaknesses that can feel really vulnerable. So it's it's kind of about creating a family culture of we all have strengths and weaknesses. God never gave anyone all the strengths because he wants us to know, he wants us to have some guidance from how he's created us towards what we're supposed to do with our lives. And so of course, we're going to have things that are easier for us and things that are harder. And so that gives us wisdom. And so then just kind of building a family culture of we can just kind of enjoy the that truth, even laugh about it, you know, oh, I am just not good with recognizing social cues. (laughs) That was actually true of me and one of our sons. And we would laugh about it as a family. But we were also both kind of math heads and, you know, just had a lot of skills in other areas. And so it's just to be able to, to laugh about that. That's kind of like the, the background tone or attitude that then can help you have a a deeper conversation 
about, you know, a specific diagnosis that might pair up with these strengths and weaknesses? I triple that. I love the idea of their strengths and weaknesses. And that's where, where we start with the conversation. And I would even say like doing a little research around that diagnosis and finding individuals mm -hmm. in are alive now or in the past and put in and doing research around the strengths that are the other side of a diagnosis. So that when you come to your child and talk about it, you're talking about both sides and you can talk about, you know, somebody in history and what they were able to do because of mm -hmm. the strength that they have that maybe wasn't even understood by all the people around them. I think that's a great way to have the conversation with your kids. Like I heard a statistic once, I think that 75% of artists also have dyslexia. So wow. you know, yeah. like what are the strengths that go with this challenge? And if they didn't have that ability to, you know, kind of flip things around in their head or whatever, they probably wouldn't be as visually creative. I love that. I, I really, I remember coming home from a seminar and hearing this whole workshop from a guy who had dyslexia, who talked about in Israel, they had gone out to find people with neurodiversity, people who had a diagnosis of autism and dyslexia and thought about things different to help them create a new military system. And it's a system that is protecting Israel right now is in is like state of the art and functional. And I loved coming home and telling my daughter that and even like internalizing that for myself. So I just think that mm -hmm. celebrating the good within the diagnosis is yeah. I think huge. I'd like to move on right now though. You know, our last podcast was really fun. We had a great conversation with two of our parent coaches actually, but we also brought on one of their sons and his name was Rylan. He's 10 years old. His mom was Katie, Katie Wetzel. And Ryan has a couple of different diagnoses, but he really gave us this mic drop moment at the end of the podcast. When I asked him what the best thing was that his parents do, and what he would recommend to other parents. And Lynn and Mandy, here's what he said. He would recommend to parents to listen. He said, parents need to look at the emotional side of it before looking for practical solutions. It was a powerful moment at the end of our last podcast. And so as we are starting to pull apart the after the diagnosis season of families, I want us to just pause here a minute. Because before we get into the conversation about meds and, you know, all the things, what does that stir in your minds, Lynn and Mandy, as you hear this 10-year-old boy telling parents, please listen? I love the fact that even to gain that quote, you all asked Rylan <laughs> what his parents were doing well. It's the, it's a question that's asked of, you know, the, the kids in our life to invite them to tell us things that we can then listen to. And I just, I think I learned that from connected families, which as I have my kids getting to be teenagers, that the best thing that I can do for them is to listen. And so asking a, a question or just, you know, sort of having the presence to just be there with them, because that really shows that I value understanding them. And it's a practice. It's not easy. I have had to sort of actually change some habits in my life so that I have the energy and the focus to be able to listen to them, especially when it comes at like 830 at night, you know, when everybody's <laughs> trying to get ready for bed, that always feels like the classic time. And just to be able to sort of have that moment and say, okay, yeah, I, I need to listen right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, I, I thought when I when I saw this topic, I thought, you know, what are some practical questions that could help parents to set their child up to start to share some of those things? And so I thought, you know, what do you love about how your brain works? And what's hard about it? Another question could be if there's one thing that's hard and frustrating that could be better, what would that be? And that kind of gives you food for thought about what help does this child really need? What are the things that they would want to lean into to make their life better? 
not just what's my agenda to make my life smoother with this challenging child. And then finally, what do I do that is the most helpful? And then what do I do that's the least helpful? Because I want to know that as we move forward. So those are just some thoughts that I had about questions that could be kind of question starters. And Stacey, you've done a whole course on the power of questions. So if this piques somebody's interest, we've got (laughs) something for you. (laughs) We've got more for you if you want to learn how to ask questions. And I know I remember when I was first starting to learn coaching and of course, practice it on my kids. It's tell me more three words. If that's all you can get out in the moment, just, just (laughs) tell me more is enough. Like you're just creating opportunity, you know, in preparation for this podcast, I asked some questions to our alumni group that all the parents who have gone through the discipline that connects. And I asked them how they support their kids. And there was just some super great feedback. That's just a huge, wonderful community that we have. But I heard the response, listen to my kids many times in the comments. And I just want to read one quote that one of the parents wrote, because I just think it's so powerful, especially we've been hanging around connected families a while and you know our framework. So here's what one parent said. Her doctor gave her this quote. The doctor said, the difference between kids who work through their challenges and those that don't was usually a parent who legitimately wanted to listen and understand even during a meltdown. And then the parent said this, sometimes I think I'm sending my child a you are safe, you are loved message. But when I'm in problem solving mode, probably trying to stop that meltdown, instead of listening, they don't feel valued or loved the way Christ loved us. Wow. I just feel like that's so powerful because... We want to communicate the messages safe and loved, but that I can fix this. We need to stop the meltdown is really an opposite message. Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. Well, and it's, it's hitting me about how much the, what's going on in me as a parent sort Mm -hmm. of plays out because that, that we're legitimately wanting to listen and to understand, because I think that there's the moment where I'm sort of like sitting there looking at them that I'm like, look like I'm listening, but I'm thinking problem solving (laughs) mode. And it just really gives me pause to consider, you know, again, what are the things that are going on in me that are going to help me legitimately listen? Yeah, that's good. That kind of reminds me of just like, it really causes us to look at what's going on in us, in our foundation. Are we sincerely wanting to connect with our kids and partner with them? And I was kind of praying through this podcast this morning and the verse Ecclesiastes 4.12 popped into my mind. And so, the, so well, I didn't know it by the reference, but I searched <laughs> Google my Bible friend on a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And of course, it pops up with all these marriage articles, right? But there's nothing about marriage in there. And I just think if we look at this situation of our child diagnosis as we're in a three cord strand with them and the Lord to walk forward through this uh, in a way that relies on his guidance and just seeks the true best for that child, that's a powerful paradigm for this Mm -hmm. whole thing, rather than I've got to go to the professionals, have them tell me what to do, and then I'm going to go fix my child. Really thinking of It's the Lord and myself and my child. And then we're going to add cords of maybe there's another parent in the picture or a a trusted physician or whatever. The more more strands in that cord, the stronger that will be to help us proceed forward. Well, Lynn, I don't know if, if you did that on purpose or not, but that was a great segue to my next question. After you get the diagnosis, Who should I gather around to be my part of my team, my child's team, our family's team in this? (laughs) Mandy, go ahead. Well, I just was even thinking through the gift over the years of people who seem to have come in threes in my life. You know, I'm sure that's not on purpose (laughs) that the Lord has provided me with, you know, people through the years. And so I honestly would say that the first folks to gather 
are probably the people that you trust. It might be a, another parent that's involved. It might be friends, family members that are, are, are supportive for you so that that way you can have sounding board and you know, sort of a way to process the information that you're, that you're getting. Then of course it's healthcare team. So most of the time you're going to have a primary care provider involved there. There may be some additional therapy that the child is going to have maybe in the form of cognitive therapy or behavioral therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy. There's all the therapies. <laughs> mm -hmm. And those may be resources that are helpful to gather. And then in different specialty or uh, different situations for those diagnoses, there are some specialists that would also be very helpful. So child psychiatry, child psychology, as well as some of the school support systems. There are often, you know, sort of learning programs that mm -hmm. need to be set up for the child. So the school gathering them as a resource as well is always going to be helpful. That's really good, Mandy, and reminds me um, of the resource that we offered people in our last podcast to. We had Taylor Irby on, and she had created like a one-page little document to fill out that kind of boiled it all down to give to your child's teacher to help them. Because the teacher's not going to want to read through a booklet of diagnosis information, but they do need to know. So that's really good. Yeah, Lynn, do you have anything to add? So it kind of helps to just prayerfully consider what, what might be some feeder issues, some causes of your child struggling more than most. And sometimes it, it can be just their gut biome. And there's so much research about that now connected to ADHD and autism. And our kids, the one that had the most intense ADHD has had for sure the most gut issues. So maybe your child has had issues with tummy aches and constipation from day one then that could be some help in that area or a natural health practitioner or whatever, because like 80% of our serotonin, kind of that feel good hormone that Mandy can comment on <laughs> is made in the gut and sent to the brain. So there's huge, most of the communication between gut and brain is gut to brain. So that can be a big issue for kids. Mandy, what do you have to add to that? So glad that you're mentioning that because, you know, often our talking to folks about issues like constipation or, you know, diarrhea and this, you know, there's various conditions that get diagnosed like irritable bowel syndrome, these sorts of things. And folks don't always make the connection that there is this brain body connection. And it really is the serotonin receptors that sort of cause that there's those types of receptors in our brain and in our gut. So there's that interaction that absolutely happens. So another issue can be sensory. You know, if you've got a child that you sense, it's got really big sensory issues, probably a good step to take them to occupational therapy. And we have a, a blog post that we'll put in the link with a checklist about that. So or start by getting the sense of intense course, right, Lynn? <laughs> of course. There's and almost an ebook that is just about sensory to help you do that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Well, learning difficulties, you know, trauma, if, if your child is really struggling with sleep and screens issues, that can make a huge difference. So figuring out if is there anything that's aggravating this sensitive or unique brain wiring, and then how can you get help related specifically to those issues? Okay, I'd like to move on to the topic of meds with a little bit of fear and trepidation. I know it's charged. <laughs> Right? And there's people that are on, you know, all different sides of is it do it or not all the things, all the things. And we're not going to get into all of that. But I do want to ask a few of these questions because, well, they came from our alumni group, our great community. And so I know it's on parents' hearts and they're grappling with these questions. So let me just start with the first one. How do I respond if my doctor wants to try meds? I'm picturing the parent in the doctor's office. They probably maybe just got the diagnosis. They're still sitting there and the doctor's like, ready for me to write it? And they're like, oh, I have to decide right now. So Mandy, what would you say to that? How do I respond? Well, I think that this is where we can kick in our asking a good question as a way to help us, you know, respond. And you may have already, you know, as the parent come in 
ready to have the conversation about medications. As we talked about in the last podcast, there's a lot of sort of the forward preparation that you could do. And most of us do. And now that we have access to as much information as we do on the internet, we can do. So you may be ready to have that conversation, but it is always worthwhile to pause and just ask, like, what are the, you know, what are the benefits? What are the side effects? And always to just use that question that you said, Stacey, tell me more. (laughs) (laughs) It's always okay to use in the doctor's office. So if you need more time to sort of process, ask more questions. And if the physician is going to be present with you, you'll be able to tell. Sometimes folks get in a hurry and want to just kind of finish up the visit, but be sure and ask those questions that you need to. And it's okay to say, you know, boy, tell me what my options are. I want that information from you, but then I want to think about it and pray about it, you know, to say all of that, but (laughs) Um, I want to consider this carefully. And how would I get back to you about my decision so that no one feels rushed into it? They feel kind of in charge of their child's life situation and can then move forward with confidence if that's the direction that they think is best. It makes me think that when you can take a step out, wait to make the decision, it gives you the opportunity to talk with your child about it too. They're a component, if they're old enough to understand, you know, what's happening. You know, I just have had recent experiences with my kids starting on various medications, maybe for cold or, you know, other types of things. And I have to have a conversation with them about what it means about when you take it, you know, if you have to take it with food, you know, there's some very basic things that we want to make sure our, our kids are involved in that conversation. Mm -hmm, For sure. Yeah. And I think that's really vital. And that's kind of why I put in that question about what's really frustrating you. It could be better life would be better because then that may lead your child to decide, yes, I want to try this. So to have that buy-in is really vital. And we tried both of our boys on some medication. And for one of them, it was just a great tool. His impulsivity was so high that he was losing friends at school and he was like ready for that. And it helped bridge him between the end of grade school and the beginning of middle school, which was a lot more stimulating and he had what he needed, but then our other son couldn't sleep on it. So, but they were both involved in that decision. It wasn't like, okay, here's what we're going to give you because we need to fix this problem. No, I can just verify so many times when, you know, whether it's a parent or a child that, you know, I've started a medication and in follow-up, you know, they just come back and say, wow, my life is so much better as a result of this. But then there are other times when it doesn't work out as well. And so what I have really grown to see medications as one of the tools in our toolbox. And thankfully we live in a time where we have those resources that can be so helpful, but there are many tools that are available to us to help with Mm -hmm. treatment in addition to medications. So what are some non-medical tools that are out there? There's a lot of stuff right now. Just the the OT is a a good starting place in general because it's so broad and insurance will often cover it. So one of my earliest patients was a four-year-old who was diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder. And the doctor said, this is the most oppositionally defiant child I've ever seen. And when I saw him in the clinic, he was the most sensory defensive child that I had ever seen. Like his parents Mm. had to brush his teeth when he was asleep. (laughs) So, you know, he changed dramatically over the course of treatments. That can be a good starting place. There's some other facilities that can be helpful with sort of generalized neurodiversity kinds of issues. There's brain balance centers for kids that are really struggling. The Family Hope Center in Pennsylvania. Our son, Noah, went through vision therapy when he was 16, 17, 16 and 17, because he had started to get in lots of fender benders when he was driving. And I knew that he was just had issues with peripheral awareness. 
And, but when he went through that, his ADHD improved so much. So vision therapy is another option that has been helpful for parents. And then there's lots of resources available for learning difficulties. Like I said, natural health practitioners to help with gut biome. What would you add to that, Mandy? Well, I think you've covered a lot of them. I always want to hit sleep again. I feel like that's one of those things that we've, you know, we keep mentioning, but I have had many a patient over the years, you know, just really when you get down to the root cause of a lot of the, you know, maybe co-occurring anxiety, depression that might happen with some of the ADHD, that sleep is a huge component, just not getting enough sleep. Of course, the dietary approaches, and and those are, are very unique. I mean, there's a lot of different information out there. And what it really boils down to for me is a little bit of trial and error with our kids to figure out like what, what works, but fruits and vegetables are always a good target. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's why we have a picky eater resource in the course, because that is so common for these sensitive, intense kids to have aversion to, to different foods. And they kind of gravitate towards the white and brown food group, <laughs> <laughs> burgers, fries. I have been pleasantly surprised with my kids that are more sensitive that they, you know, definitely tend towards, you know, those, those foods that you mentioned, but they actually really like fresh fruits and vegetables. So I can't mushy, you know, cooked, that doesn't work, but actually fresh fruits and vegetables really are something that they have enjoyed. So that actually makes life easier in some ways. I love it. Sounds like you asked a few questions, Mandy, like, what is it about that carrot? That's that carrot that you don't like. And what is it about that carrot that you do like? I, I love that. Uh, always curious. Stay curious, right? Stay listening. Is there a theme here today, everybody? I think there is. <laughs> Mandy, let me just ask you, this is specific to ADHD, but one parent asked, can children outgrow ADHD? That's a, it's a great question. And I would tie it back to this idea that ADHD probably represents something having to do with our cognitive wiring in our brains. So there's, you know, genetic components of that. There are environmental components of it, as we talked about in the first podcast. So I would say that those are not things that we outgrow, but our brains do develop and they become sort of expanded and they, you know, grow based on skill building. So, you know, there's different ways that we figure out function with the way that we're built. So mm. I would say that it's something that is, is an enduring part of how each individual is built with ADHD, but there's ways that our brains grow and develop depending on the skills and the treatments that we receive and the environment that we're in. Even as a person with dyslexia, I get that, right? I've learned how to manage life with it. And some parts have gotten better and some I just know how to manage different. Yeah. It's like our, our we have one son who he cannot for the life of him learn to push his chair in after he's at a, at a meal and he's tried do-overs. He's tried everything, you know, so there's little remnants of his ADHD, but my gosh, he's functioning in life beautifully, has a great job and a marriage. And so there's what land, even though he doesn't push in his chair, <laughs> his wife is so patient. <laughs> I was just glad I married someone who didn't care if the bed was made or not. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> that is not our priority. Yeah. So it's kind of boils down to quirks plus really good general life function. <laughs> yeah. Well, isn't that all of us? And we're all working towards that. Yeah. So good. The so one thing that I'll tie to the, you know, sort of question about medication, because that mm -hmm. is often what people are asking this, what's under that question is sort of how long will medication be necessary? And I think it's one of those that it's worth sort of always reevaluating because there's definitely folks that find benefit throughout their life by taking medication. So it's always the blend of medication with all of these other skills and tools that we're talking about. But there are folks that sometimes do find that as a result of you know, maybe environmental changes or these sorts of things have less need for the medication to help them with their symptoms. So I think mm -hmm. it's just sort of that, again, staying in conversation and then having, obviously 
the kids that are being treated become adults. And so having them grow into recognizing what are their symptoms and how does the medication help with that or not. And so then they can help with making those decisions. Well, Lynn and Mandy, I'd love to wrap up this podcast. It's been really good. I know that it's been super useful for many, many people and, and I believe encouraging and hopeful and we all believe that, don't we? There's yeah. these, these kids with just those differently wired brains just often have so much potential in life. Yeah. And so keeping our eyes on that can be really helpful. Mm-hmm. Well, Mandy, thanks for being here. It has been such a great chance to catch up with both of you and hear all about the Sensitive Intense course. And I'm excited to jump into that myself. And thanks for letting me be a part of another podcast. For sure. And thanks, Lynn. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Stacy. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for tuning in today, friends. Since you have listened through the entire show, I have a coupon code for you. (laughs) There's two weeks left to register for the Sensitive and Intense Kids, the Community and Support version. So get a pen and paper. Here it is. Use code SM20 and you will get 20% off the course when you register, right? Hey, and if you're military, make sure you email us because you get even more off. I'm not going to put that in the show notes. So listeners, that's just for you. Well, hey, everybody go to the show notes for links for everything that we've mentioned today. I want you to know we are a listener supported organization over 45,000 parents like you listen to this podcast every month. Individual donations make the work to equip and encourage families possible. For more information about Connected Families, follow us on Instagram or Facebook or go to connectedfamilies.org. I will see you next time.